U.S. Naval War College is a Navy's home of thought. Established in 1884, NWC has become the center of naval sea power, both strategically and intellectually. The following Issues in National Security Lecture is specifically designed to offer scholarly lectures to all participants. We hope you enjoy this upcoming discussion and future lectures. Well, good afternoon, and I, it's my pleasure to welcome you to the second summer series lecture. I'm John Jackson, and I will serve as host for today's event. Admiral Chatfield is unable to be with us today, but I'm pleased to welcome you on her behalf. We've enjoyed bringing you this service series as a way to share a portion of the Naval War College's academic experience with the spouses and significant others of our student body. It has been expanded to include participation by the entire Naval War College extended family, including members of the Naval War College Foundation, international sponsors, civilian employees, colleagues throughout Naval Station Newport, and participants from around the world. Looking ahead, on the 27th of July, Dr. Mike O'Hara will talk about the future of war. And on 10 August, Dr. John Mauro will talk about Winston Churchill. Our 16 lecture series for academic year 2021-2022 will commence on 7 September. We anticipate that three of the lectures will be presented in person on campus and the others will be shown here on Zoom. Okay, on with the main event. During the presentation that follows, please feel free to ask questions using the chat feature on Zoom and we will get to as many as we can at the conclusion of the presentation. Technology and increasing levels of education have exposed people to more information than ever before. Today, everyone knows everything. With only a quick trip through WebMD or Wikipedia, average citizens believe themselves to be on an equal intellectual footing with doctors and diplomats. All voices, even the most ridiculous, demand to be taken with equal seriousness, and any claim to the contrary is dismissed as undemocratic elitism. Today, our speaker will discuss how we got where we are and what this situation means for the future of our democracy. Dr. Tom Nichols is a Navy War College professor and an adjunct at the U.S. Air Force School of Strategic Force Studies and at the Harvard Extension School. He is a specialist on international security affairs, including U.S.-Russia relations, nuclear strategy, and NATO issues. A nationally known commentator on U.S. politics and national security, he is a columnist for USA Today and a contributing writer at The Atlantic. He served as a staff member in the U.S. Senate and has held fellowships at CSIS and the Kennedy School. He's taught at Dartmouth, LaSalle, and Georgetown. And interestingly enough, he is also a five-time undefeated Jeopardy champion. So if our category is noted national security educators, our first question is, who is the author of the death of expertise? Contestant number one, the digital microphone is yours. Thank you, John. And thank you all uh, for being here. Um, what I will try to do here is in about, uh, for the hour we have, I'll try to spend about half of that giving you an overview of uh, what I wrote in the book and why I think this is a problem. And then I'll try and move as quickly as I can to Q&A because I think that um, usually is where um, folks really want to participate, especially in something as controversial uh, or potentially controversial as this. So let me just put this up and begin sharing some slides and I will take you through it. <clears throat> Oops. And yeah, so I'm off to, there we go. Okay, so um, the... The book is actually called The Death of Expertise, but that's not a new uh, phrase. That's been around for a little while, but I'm also gonna add here that I'm not representing the government of the War College uh, on anything I say here as I didn't uh, in the book. And I, I think the first question is, why would I even write something like this? Um, why would I write a, a book with such a um, potentially controversial title? Because we all know that expertise isn't really dead. We're surrounded, all most of the people sitting here right now, we're all experts. We all have something we're good at. Um, we know that we can consult experts um, when we have issues, whether it's going to our doctor, a car mechanic, plumber, whoever. And 
really, you know, is this new? I mean, when I first started talking about this, I had to admit, you know, is this just um, pointy headed college professors complaining that people don't listen to college professors? Uh, that part isn't new. And that's not why I wrote the book. People have always distrusted experts or intellectuals um, because it's, it's exclusive. Uh, and again, whether it's your car mechanic or your doctor, you don't know that material. So you're a little suspicious. You always want a second opinion. You're not quite sure what you're being told. That, that's normal. And particularly with college professors, I tell a story in the book. My late brother, God rest his soul, he used to run a bar. And I, when I was a young professor, I'd drive down to my hometown it was near uh, New Hampshire. I was teaching at Dartmouth. I grew up in Massachusetts. I'd go down to my brother's bar and hang out. And one day I, I left and my brother told me later, a guy at the bar looked over and he said, so you, your brother's a college professor? <clears throat> my brother said, yeah. And the guy says, hmm, seems like a good guy anyway. Like that's, that's normal. People just kind of have that image in their heads. What's different and what made me write the book was an emerging problem where people think they're smarter than experts, that where they don't want a second opinion, they want to substitute their own opinion. And that's what's really becoming scary. Um, and I interviewed a lot of people across a lot of fields. And again, it's from doctors, to diplomats, ordinary people saying, medicine, let me explain that to you. Nuclear arms trainees, I've got that. Um, how worrisome is this? Well, let me give you a few examples, because the other part of this that made me write the book is not only that people think they're experts or think that they're smarter than experts, but they are super, super confident about that. Um, <clears throat> and yet their knowledge base is pretty low. For example, the Washington Post asked uh, Americans back uh, when, the, when the Russians first invaded Crimea and Ukraine what we should do about the Russian invasion. And a lot of Americans had some really strong views on this, including putting U.S. troops uh, into Ukraine. Excuse me, I'm just uh, like popping my glasses here. Um, and, and, you know, putting actual NATO and U.S. forces into Ukraine, or as we political scientists would call it, World War III. Um, the problem was that people who said this were people who did, tended not to know where Ukraine is. And this is a great Jeopardy question, by the way. Ukraine is the largest country whose borders are entirely within Europe. And so if you're wondering where it is, it's right there. The problem is that the average respondent in this poll uh, was off by about 1,800 miles, which meant that you know, roughly half the people involved couldn't put Ukraine on the right continent. And the further off you were, the more likely you were to think military force was a good option. This is a great map and it's one that always blows my mind. See all these little blue dots in front of you? Every one of these dots is the guess of an American adult about where North Korea is. <clears throat> now think about that for a moment. Only about 32%, including college educated respondents, only about 32%, roughly a third of respondents were able to identify North Korea. And my favorite part of this are the people who uh, got it, that it was in on the Korean Peninsula, if you look up there, uh, but for some reason thought it, it was in the Southern tip of the Korean Peninsula, even though North is right in the name of North Korea. Um, other people, of course, thought it was in Sri Lanka, Siberia, Australia, the middle of the Pacific, all over the place. And yet people have very definite attitudes about war and peace and what we ought to do about things like the North Korean nuclear program. They just don't have any idea where it is. Um, one of my favorite polls some years ago was a poll that a left-leaning pollster did trying to prove that uh, Republicans were somewhat more warlike than Democrats. Um, and it turns out everybody involved got an ugly surprise. Um, they were polled, Democrats and Republicans were polled about bombing Agrabah. And um, Americans of both parties, as it turns out, did have pretty strong feelings about this. And Republicans, in fact, were much more willing to bomb Agrabah. Uh, Democrats, as it turned out, had very strong feelings about not bombing Agrabah and not using military force. This is Agrabah. It's the fictional character in the movie Aladdin. Roughly half of the respondents had a very strong opinion about whether or not to bomb a cartoon. 
Um, I could, the book has more examples of this. Um, my favorite, and I'll talk about this when we talk about democracy, but I'll just foreshadow this a bit. My favorite are the people who are very insistent on um, overturning Obamacare, uh, but are equally insistent that we should keep the Affordable Care Act because roughly a third of the public doesn't know that they're the same thing. All right, well, how did this happen? Uh, I identify three culprits. Most people, by the way, when I think about, when I started to talk about how did this happen, they say, well, it's the internet, right? The internet has made us stupid. Um, no, the internet has made it worse and put it all on steroids, uh, as has talk radio and uh, the way we do higher education. Um, and I'll talk about each of these individually, but I have to tell you that underlying all of this, and I actually talk about this in the next book I've written coming out next month called Our Own Worst Enemy. What's really going on here is that we've been suffering a 40 year long epidemic of narcissism. And that underlies all of these things. For example, in higher education, and you know, I've, I've had a pretty successful career at the War College. I've taught at Dartmouth, I've taught at Georgetown. I've, I've had a good run all the places I've taught. So this is not, you know, sour grapes about those darn kids. Um, but colleges now are heavily, and I, I hate to say, even the war college to some extent, we spend too much time on what I call a therapeutic model of education, where we are constantly asking the students, are you okay? Are you happy? Did you like this? Did you enjoy this course? Did you feel fulfilled? Does this feel important to you? when in fact the students really aren't in a position to answer those questions. We're asking them questions as if they're reviewing a restaurant. You know, did the, did the world religion course have enough spice? Did the English course, was it warm enough? Um, we spend a huge amount of time, particularly with undergraduates, making sure they're happy instead of making sure they're uncomfortable, which is really what college and higher education should be about. And college should make you a, a little uncomfortable. It should be a place where you have to challenge yourself and, and question whether the things you believe in are really true. Um, with the media and talk radio, uh, part of the problem here is, is the explosion of bandwidth. Now, I, I'm not going to say that the world was a better place when the news was 28, actually, some of us here are old enough to remember the news used to be 15 minutes long before the Vietnam War. Um, so I'm not sure that the world was better informed when the news was only 28 minutes and it was pretty much the same string of news curated by you know, corporate executives and read by old um, distinguished looking white guys. Uh, on the other hand, the need to constantly fill bandwidth and the need to find and hold an audience has created um, a lot of nonsense, a lot of fake expertise, and a lot of tribalistic politics where you can spend all day long watching television and really not be very well informed, but feel very much part of a team. Whether you're watching Fox or MSNBC or whatever, um, you can watch hours and hours of television and, and not end up knowing as much as you should probably know and that you could learn from um, reading a newspaper for 30 or 40 minutes. And finally, there is the problem of the internet. And, and one of the things that I think, I, I'm actually a technological optimist. I'm 60, so the internet, I kind of came of age when the internet did. I was actually the, the, computer, the computer committee at Dartmouth in 1989 in my department was me um, because I was 28 and I was the only guy that understood any of that stuff. Um, <clears throat> but the internet has, has turned our brains to mush uh, in the sense that it, provides shortcuts um, to thinking you know stuff, uh, to clicking through pages and saying, uh, you know, I read up on this. I did my research. I know things. When in fact, you, you don't know anything. You have, you know, plowed through some algorithms. You have gone to one of the, you know, nearly, I think at this point, there's a, over a billion websites. Um, you, you really may not have learned anything. And some of the things you may have learned, you're not equipped to understand. I, I did a presentation once where a guy, um, or I was going pretty hard at the anti-vaccine people. This was long before the pandemic. And um, he said, well, why do I need to take anybody's word for it? Issues of the Lancet and the New England Journal of Medicine are available online. And I said, they weren't written for you. 
you don't understand what you're reading. They're written for doctors and experienced researchers. And, you know, this guy got really mad. Um, but I said, you know, I'm sorry, but, um, you know, if you're a high school history teacher, The Lancet wasn't written for you. It's, it's not something you'll understand. But people feel very strongly that if it's on the internet, it's therefore comprehensible. And I think students in particular, this is a real danger. I've had younger people say to me, well, but professor, you know, the internet's just a big library. And I say, I always say, no, uh, libraries have um, librarians. The internet is a dumpster and it has all kinds of stuff on it. And you may get lucky and find an uneaten filet mignon, but mostly what you're going to find is, you know, garbage. And uh, again, I think we've created a generation of people who feel very confident in their ability to, to sort of sort through all this. Um, I've had students tell me over and over again, well, I'm, I'm good at discriminating sources of information. And my answer is always the same. No, you're not. Almost no one is. That's why journals have editors. That's why news broadcasts have producers. That's why newspapers, I work for two major publications. I can't, I can't fastball anything past USA Today or the Atlantic without a fact checker crawling up one side of me and down the other. That's one of the reasons I stay with edited publications. Um, you know, that, that's why they exist. And the internet has none of that gatekeeping and I, and I think it's really dangerous. But here I am throwing this word around, who's an expert? Expert is one of those things when I say that people say, oh, you mean you, guys like you with your PhDs, you know, and your credentials. And yeah, okay, well, yeah, I have a PhD. It does. Georgetown University, you know, back in 19 umpty ump um, certified, you know, back during the Stone Age certified that I know stuff about government and international relations. But there is also, there are, everyone is an expert um, in something. I, I had a house fire here. I live in Middletown. Um, and I had a big house fire about three and a half years ago. And uh, I learned in a big hurry how completely useless a background in nuclear strategy is when your chimney is about to fall on you. Um, you know, and there were guys walking all over my house. Uh, Mr. Nichols, can you stand over here? Mr. Nichols, can you get out of my way? Mr. Nichols, can you maybe go out for a coffee and get the hell out of your own house because you're stupid and you don't know what you're doing? And, you know, that that is training. That is Peer affirmation. How did I know that the guy working here was a master plumber? Because he has a certificate from other plumbers that say, this guy knows what he's talking about. Um, how did I know that the contractor who did my floors and put my living room back together knew what he was doing? Because I have seen his work. Um, you know, there are many forms of expertise and people bristle at this word when they really shouldn't because expert, you know, your dentist is an expert. Your um, your uh, electrician is an expert. I, I am terrified of electrical boxes, by the way. Um, you know, when I, when I had my house fire, a guy walked in and he started, just threw up on the box and he started moving wires. And I thought, I'm going to die just standing near him. But he's an expert. He knows what he's doing. Um, and so, you know, there are credentials. There is training, peer affirmation. All of those things count. And we dismiss them now. I mean, the, the contractors who are here, and I should add this, when they asked me, when I said, geez, I feel like the victim of my own book, you know, and they said, they asked, a couple of the guys asked me about it. And they said, you would not believe how many times a homeowner stands over them and says, so uh, what kind of wire are you putting in there? As if they would have any, you, the guy could say, I'm putting in a number nine Cavatelli with a side of fettuccine. And it wouldn't make any difference because the guy asking a question has no idea, but we have become this kind of narcissistic society where we feel the need to be in charge of everything. We simply cannot admit that we don't know, you know, I mean, I, and, and I, I tried to be good about it. When the electrician said, we've got to put in a, I forget what it was, GFP, GT, whatever it was, I finally went, Jim, words, 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 power, lights, right? And he said, yes. I said, tell me why this is good. He said, it's safer. I said, I trust you because I'm not an electrician. I'm not certified by the state of Rhode Island. I believed him that this is safer. And there was no point in harassing them all day long, but people do this to each other all day long. A doctor um, I interviewed for this said, very soft-spoken guy, he's a surgeon. He said he has gotten to the point where he wants to just put the drugs and the scalpel on a tray and slide it across to the um, patient and say, you do it. 
because patients now literally walk in instead of saying, I'd like a second opinion, or I want a full explanation. They say things like, um, here's what's wrong with me. And here's what you're going to do. Uh, this actually happened. I was giving a talk in the Midwest and a pediatric surgeon in the paperback version of the book, I tell this story, a pediatric surgeon came up and said, a couple came to him and said, here is the procedure we are contracting you to perform on our daughter. And he said, I don't, he said, that's not how surgery works. Um, I am not a contract player. I will advise you on whether or not this is a good idea and decide whether or not to do it. But he said, and then he said, look, this is very dangerous. This, this surgery is not warranted. If, if this were my daughter, I wouldn't do it. Um, and they said, okay. And they walked out and they went and found a surgeon who would do it. And the child, as the doctor told me, the end of this story was gravely injured. Um, but the parents were like, look, we've done our research. We know what we're doing. We don't take any back talk from pediatric surgeons. Um, this is the procedure we want. And um, that, you know, that's, that kind of behavior is why I wrote the book. But I'm sure everybody's champing at the bit to say, but Tom, but, 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 what about when experts are wrong? And they are wrong. Um, experts are human beings. We are not omniscient. We are not certified to never be wrong. Um, we are also weak human beings who engage in things like thought fraud. Uh, and when I say we, I mean other people. <laughs> um, but, you know, we experts engage in fraud, falsification, exaggeration. Uh, doctors, doctors have left clamps in people. Pilots have crashed airliners. Um, the CIA director told President the second President Bush, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq is a slam dunk. Um, <clears throat> my point in all this is this is not a case for demissing experts. It's a case for bringing in more expertise. It's a case for bringing in red teams, team B, um, second opinions. It's not a case for saying, well, experts, I, I, someone said to me during a talk once, um, we were talking about eggs. I talk about this in the book. I like eggs and I gave my own Dr. Hell because I said, oh, I can eat eggs now. And he kind of hung his head and he said, yeah, we were wrong about that. Um, of course, the people who found out they were wrong about that were other doctors, but I kind of, you know, nudged him and I said, thanks doc. You know, I've been eating carbs when I should have been eating eggs. And someone in the audience said, well, this just proves that doctors don't know anything about heart disease. And I said, whoa, whoa, whoa. That's a really different issue than doctors misunderstood the mechanism of metabolizing cholesterol in an egg yolk, that's a long way to go to get to doctors don't know anything about heart disease. Um, and that leads me to the line I always use about this. Experts are not always right. They're just more likely to be right, particularly in their area of expertise, than you are. That's, that's and you know, you would think that's a very common sense kind of, um, assertion and yet you would be astonished at how people how many people say uh you know no i i can i mean the the guy who writes and i quoted him in the book the guy who does the dilbert comic strip said you can become an expert in an hour by talking to any expert in a field and having them just talk to you and you can absorb it including a president um now you know i was always a fan of the dilbert comic strip but that's just a flatly stupid thing to say um, you cannot become an expert in an hour. Any of you here who are experts in your areas, particularly military folks, imagine me as a civilian walking up to you and saying, God, just brief me on how to run a fighter squadron. Give me an hour and I'll, I'll, I got it from here. You know, tell me about, uh, you know, tell me about station keeping and, you know, how to drive a ship and give me about an hour or two and I, I can get that down and I'll just practice. But this is how I think this, and it's not just the United States. I'm going to brag slightly here and say, you know, when I wrote the book, I really thought I was mostly castigating Americans because Americans are the very much the let me tell you kind of guys, you know, we're, we're big talkers. Um, but the death of expertise is now um, in 14 languages around the world. And I was pretty shocked by that. Uh, you know, when the first foreign contracts coming, came in from places like Korea and Japan, I was like, I'm sorry, does Japan have a problem with, you know, expertise? But I think it shows that in an advanced post-industrial society where there's a lot of education, and I, um, I'll probably get questions about this, but I'm going to say, 
maybe too many of us are going to college um, for the wrong things and, and certainly going to college at all. Um, but I think when you have super high levels of universal college education, the internet, um, a, a culture that you know is kind of a trophy and achievement culture, you get people all over the world. I mean, I professors in places like um, you know Australia and Germany were telling me things like, "Oh yeah, my students are like this," and I, I just I was really shocked. I mean, it was gratifying. You know, it's nice to brag and say, "Oh, my books in this many languages." But it also really un, kind of unsettled me to think that something I thought was mostly a cultural problem in my country turns out to be a global problem. But, but there is no doubt about it. P experts, and particularly when advising policymakers, and I was one of those expert advisors, I did make mistakes. Um, we're, gonna, we're gonna screw up. Um, but you know, the policymakers are the policymakers. Experts are the advisors. And um, you know, a good policymaker does not rely on one expert. My, I, um, you know, I can talk more about this later, but during the first Gulf War, um, I was working for the Senator from Pennsylvania and he asked me for a, what, what then would have been a very classified estimate of casualties. And of course I, mine were super low because I was getting some really good information from the DOD and working on that with folks at the Pentagon. And he blew up, he, he threw me out of it. He literally threw me out of his office in a hail of F-bombs. And um, then he went upstairs and checked with some other folks at the Senate Intelligence Committee. And after he talked to a bunch of other experts, he said, okay, I, I see what you guys are about. I got it. Um, you know, and we, we turned out to be right. Um, but, you know, you cannot expect that, um, and I think this is also part of the very high standard of living we've become used to, um, you cannot expect a zero defect world of expertise. Like everybody else, we kind of do our best. And that brings me to the last point here, which is that in a, in a democracy, and particularly in a republic like ours, we have to rely on expertise and delegated decision making. We, we just cannot all gather in the public square every year and approve the budget. You know, the, the Swiss do this. And I, I gave this talk in um, Switzerland and uh, it was an interesting, they had invited me because the Swiss do have a dem direct democracy. They literally do vote on like everything by referendum. And uh, there are people in the Swiss democracy business who are wondering, you know, can we go on like this? Because the Swiss public is becoming kind of um, lazy and uninformed. And there are people in Switzerland saying, you know, can we survive this way? But Switzerland is a small place with a lot of decentralized local control. Um, the United States cannot survive on ignorance. Elected representatives cannot just become megaphones for what the people back home say. And you've seen this now with, um, people in Congress saying things like, well, I'm just, this is what my people want. And pe the voters back home saying, we didn't send them there to make his own decisions. We, we, um, we send them there to make our decision, you know, to do the things we want. And, you know, maybe I'm just an old school Burkean conservative here, but that is not what democracy is about. Um, that, if that's the case, then you can just have everything settled by an internet poll. And you don't need to gather uh, five or 600 people in the halls of Congress and debate it. Um, we, we literally cannot go on this way as a democracy. No one can. Um, you know, we can't, we can't survive without agreement on basic facts. We can't survive without agreement on what constitutes science and knowledge. We can't survive um, if we simply tell our elected representatives, it doesn't matter if we're all wrong and angry, just do the thing we're telling you to do. Um, because then we do this, this New Yorker commercial uh, cartoon that everyone in the world sent me for a while um, was, uh, you know, we will become like that. These smug pilots have lost touch with regular passengers like us. Who thinks I should fly the plane? Um, you know, things just don't work that way. We have an accountability mechanism in a democracy, it's called elections. And if you don't like the policies that you're getting, um, vote for people who are going to make different policies. Um, but you, you, you're not going to vote on the nature of reality 
or what constitutes a fact. And unfortunately, um, we really have reached that point where, you know, again, people say, I have very, I have very deep thoughts about healthcare, but I don't know that the ACA and Obamacare are the same thing. Um, that that's really dangerous. That's when um, we become uh, not a republic, but um, you know, a mobocracy. And that's partly why I wrote the book because I I just in the end I don't think that um, you know it's it's entertaining to talk about the things people don't know and it can be kind of funny, but in the end um, this left me with a very dark and unsettled feeling that democracy cannot survive this way. So I'll stop there and I will leave the rest of the time for Q and A and um, be happy to take your questions. Okay, Tom, thank you very much. Uh, uh, you have uh, generated uh, quite a few issues and quite a few questions. Uh, my personal question is, I saw the black cat typing on that computer. When does that book come out? <laughs> uh, that comes out August, I, that will drop August 19th. Very good, sir. Okay, uh, question, uh, you had some pushback on the term dumpster. Uh, as a descriptive term for the internet. Some said absolutely that's an inappropriate term and others said, no, I guess that's really what it is. You wanna expand on why your view is that it's a dumpster and not a library? Because the, first of all, there is no way to gatekeep the difference between um, you know, the Middle East Studies Department at Princeton University and ISIS. They can, all you have to do, for, any of you can open a website and call it call it news, call it opinion, call it facts, call it whatever you want for six, seven, ten bucks a month. I used to have a blog with my own domain, and I finally gave it up because I realized that was part of the problem. Um, you know, as I tell my students, it's okay to have thoughts you don't express. You don't need to keep a running diary on your own, you know, uh, joeblow.com domain. Um, I, I kind of swore that I would... Uh, always work with uh, editors. Um, and when students ask me what they should trust, I say, ask, is this, is this thing you're looking at, does it have an editorial masthead? Are there people who will answer for the reporting in it? Does it have a corrections page? Does it admit mistakes? Does it have some institutional longevity? Uh, which is not to say that, you know, newspapers get things wrong, too. I mean, I talk in the in the piece about some religion writer at the New York Times referred to Easter as the day when Jesus ascended into heaven. Um, or as many of us Christians point out, well, there are about 50 days in there where, where he kind of, you know, took his time and did some other stuff. And if you're working at the New York Times, you know, you should know that. Um, but, you know, just a, a, a website, there's a billion websites. Even if 90% of them are terrible. That's 900 million bad websites. And I think the ability to just drop anything on a website on the internet is a problem. I, and by the way, I was approached, I, I thought about it, and every now and then I still think about it. I've been approached by places like Substack and Patreon and others, and I am afraid to work without editors. I really am. I just think it's just too easy to say things that are dumb or not true. Uh, and so I think, you know, this, this notion that the internet is this, I love the internet. I mean, I'm sitting here talking to all of you on it. I have a Twitter account. I have a Facebook account, but the idea that somehow the internet isn't this giant cesspool is, um, it's, I, I think defies empirical reality. There are great sites on the internet. Um, but most of them are just dumped there. The other thing, and I'll, and I'll get off this soapbox is that most people are completely unaware of the notion of algorithms. You know, if you, <clears throat> excuse me, if you do a search for um, how do you make chicken soup, you're going to get ads from Campbell's and Progresso. The, the internet is built to drive traffic that way. Someone made a joke about me a while back that this, I usually use a big uh, chair when I'm sitting at my desk here. And someone said, well, and it's a guy that doesn't particularly like me very much. He said, oh, I'm sorry to see that Tom Nichols is in a wheelchair now. And the algorithm caught fire on the internet. And to this day, there are people who, who think that I am a, a paraplegic or a quadriplegic because the, it, the algorithm seized on disability and my name and just kept putting that together in searches. I'm sorry, that is a dumpster. That's crazy. Um, and I think just like with 
newspapers or books, there is a difference between a book published by Random House or the University of Kansas Press and a book published by Joe's Garage Press in Joe's Garage. Uh, I am a big fan of gatekeepers and people taking responsibility for content that's put out there. So I, I, I think that that, you know, is really, I, the idea that the internet has that, it, do, it does not. Um, someone asked, just to tie that up, someone asked about Wikipedia. I talk about Wikipedia in the book. I actually corresponded with um, one of the founders of not Jimmy Wales, but um, Larry, um, his name just went out of my head. And, you know, Wikipedia is only as good as the editors who use it. Wikipedia has endless entries on things like movies and sports and porn stars and STEM and is totally awful about things like history, literature, other stuff. It's totally driven by a group of young men, mostly men, most of the editors are men. And so, you know, it's not an encyclopedia. It's a kind of a public chat club that is moderately edited. I tell my students, don't, unless you're looking at like a simple date or something, don't use it. Uh, Tom, we got a comment from one of our uh, librarians that perhaps we should stress the difference between information we get from the internet and information we access via the internet yes. to a curated I'm, site or a library site. I, and I, you know, I am a huge booster of librarians. I often refer to them as among the last guardians of Western civilization and knowledge. Um, you know, that's another thing that I tell students all the time, both war college and undergrads. Uh, look, if you're in doubt, go to a librarian, go to a reference librarian. That's what they're there for. They're not like just people who shelve books. They know the difference between good books and bad books, between reputable presses and bad presses. Um, and But again, I have had so much pushback. People say, listen, I know I can... I'm good at discriminating among sources, when in fact, most people have no background in doing this, have no idea what they're talking about. And it's purely just this feel goodism of, well, I just know what I'm talking about. You don't. You, if you think that, if you walk into a library and you say, I know, I can figure all this out, then, you know, I, I will, I'm here to tell you, you can't figure that out better than a librarian. And that's, they love to be asked questions. And that's what they're there for. Uh, comment or a question here that uh, basically says, okay, you did a great job describing the problem. Could you talk a little bit more about how we fix the problem in part discussion of uh, reading things you don't necessarily want to read because it's important that you have other perspectives? Yeah, I wish you hadn't asked me that because I don't have a good answer. Um, I'm a real good social critic. I'm not a great social fixer. Um, you know, when I was on the road in 2018, 2017, 18, and 19, I said, well, a war, a depression, or a pandemic will snap us right out of this. And I was wrong. I was just wrong. I mean, pan this pandemic deepened it. We now have people that are absolutely committed to the most ignorant possible rejection of science there is. And um, we have turned... Um, science into a partisan football game in a way that, you know, I, I find astonishing. I mean, I, I'm, I'm old enough that I was vaccinated against smallpox. Um, to me, you know, this is, this, this is, you know, um, so I, I don't know what snaps us out of it. I think um, at this point, demography, I think younger people are better at this than older people. I think that, you know, one of the things we found is that people 55 and older, my generation, John, yours, um, are at, because they have a lot of time and they don't have, they have a lot of time on their hands and they don't have a lot of experience with technology. They are actually the most likely to fall for conspiracy theories and misinformation on the internet. And also in part because their primary um, form of interaction with the internet is Facebook. Um, and I just don't know what to do about that. My advice to younger people is um, turn the TV off for an hour a day and read a newspaper. Just read one newspaper. That's it. Or subscribe to one on the internet and start your day with a cup of coffee and 30 minutes of a reputable major newspaper, whether it's New York Times, the Boston Globe, the Chicago Tribune, the LA Times. I don't care what it is. Something with an editor that is committed to, you know, news stories. Um, but it shows you how stubborn people are about this. I said that to a guy at a book talk once and he said, well, what do you read? And I said, well, okay. 
I said, I'm an old Washington guy. I, I have a kind of nostalgic attachment to the Washington Post um, because it was the best politics news and it had, a, had comics in it. He said, well, I'm not, that's inside the beltway talking to itself. That's the power elite talking to itself. I said, okay, well, you know, the newspaper of record in America is the New York Times. And, you know, as long as you stay away, if you don't like the editorial slant, you know, the New York Times, he said, uh, East Coast cultural elites. I said, okay, the Wall Street Journal is in New York and no one has ever accused them of being lefty East Coast cultural elites. He said, capitalists. And I said, so what we're really playing here is a game where you want me to find the, the BS internet site that you usually go to and then tell you that's okay. I said, what do you, how do you know the things you know? And he said, well, I read things. I said, what things? And by the way, for all of you wondering how to interact with people who do this, ask them questions. Just say, where did you, someone says, you know, I know that, um, you know, Joe Biden and Donald Trump are alien lizard people here to steal our water. I just say, where, where did you read that? Where, where did you, where'd you find that out? And you'll inevitably say, well, I've read stuff. Just keep asking them, what stuff? Where? How did you find that? What source is that? And inevitably, it's, well, I was, you know, I was screwing around on my phone, and I read something cool, and it flashed, and I hit like. Um, I, other than that, I don't know what to do about it. And, you know, journalists, I, there's a whole chapter about journalism in the book. I think that this slagging of professional journalists is really um, nonsense. I've worked with a lot of journalists, both in government and then as a writer myself. You know, they actually really do try uh, to get things right. And the, yeah, they screw up. Again, you know, when the Wash, you know, 35 years ago, the Washington Post hired a woman who fabricated a whole story about childhood heroin addicts. It happens. But 99% of the other time, you know, they are getting things right and they're doing their best to get the story to you. And this arrogant, narcissistic, you know, I know things because I'm important and I have secret knowledge, you know, that you don't, you just don't. And approaching the, all of this stuff with a little more intellectual humility um, would serve us all better, but that's not what we do in modern America. I don't want to get too political on this, but uh, what's your reaction to the notion that the uh, the mainstream media is the enemy of the people? Um, I think that is a Stalinist expression that we should stop using in America. Um, the mainstream media is not the enemy of the people. The people who work in the media are your sons and daughters and brothers and sisters and people from your hometown, just like everybody else. Turns out, I didn't realize this, for example, um, the top national security writer uh, at uh, the Washington Post it not only went to my high school, he's from my neighborhood in Chicopee, Massachusetts. So if you think that guy or me, that we're these, you know, elitist enemies of the people, then you have never been to Chicopee, Massachusetts. I'll tell you that right now. This is self-serving nonsense that is pushed out by people who don't want you to believe in anything re remotely related to a fact and want to create that kind of tribal anger that there's this team and there's my team. Uh, and, you know, that that is, I think, just poisonous. And I think, you know, again, as a former Russia expert, I can tell you that vrag naroda, it's mean the original Russian, is an expression that the Soviet Union used, enemy of the people. And to use that about your fellow citizens simply because you don't happen to like the news you're reading is disgraceful. And anyone doing it should be ashamed of themselves. Could I be any clearer? Am I leaving okay, anyone grasping really, for nuance here? Tell us how you really feel. Uh, Tom, early on in the discussion, uh, there was some pushback on the notion that uh, uh, somehow we're coddling our students uh, at all levels up to and including the, the Naval War College. Would you like to expand on that? And they're asking for, do you have specific examples sure. anywhere that uh, the students are being coddled? I talk in the book about the problem of grade inflation and how, student, and how uh, schools at um, top schools, the Ivies, Stanford, have all tried to reverse policies, uh, all tried policies to kind of tamp down grade inflation and had to reverse them all. When I left Dartmouth, in the late 90s, the median grade in the government department was an A minus. 
Um, and so, you know, this, again, this notion that uh, we live and die. I and mean, one of the things I pushed for, and I think that has become better at the War College, is we used to be extremely dependent on student evaluations, as one example. I, and I never had a problem with student evaluations. I have won teaching awards at the War College, at Harvard, at other places. So again, not sour grapes. But I don't think that professors should live in fear of, uh-oh, what if the students didn't like me today? Um, sometimes the students aren't going to like you. That's how it goes. You, that's, that's the nature of the teaching enterprise. And I think that the use of these metrics from grade school all the way through to PME has become pernicious and out of control. And it's constantly checking in the temperature of the students. Are you happy? Did you feel good today? Did you like this? Um, you know, there are things that happen in a classroom that students just don't like. And it's okay for them not to like it. I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to go down the eating your broccoli road, but sometimes, you know, everything can't be ice cream. Um, but, uh, you know, examples of coddling safe spaces. I mean, I'm on this, you know, I'm totally with the, the kind of the right wingers complaining about safe spaces. I, I love what Richard Dawkins uh, said years ago. If you want a safe space, stay at home with your teddy bear and suck your thumb. Don't come to the university. Universities are not safe spaces. They're not supposed to be safe spaces. Um, they are, once you enter that, that courtyard, you know, every, as long as you are polite to other people, everything is up for grabs. Um, and yet we, you know, now we're, oh, we're concerned and, you know, was this traumatic? Did that make somebody uncomfortable? Um, between that and just the, 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 um, I think the dumbing down of curriculum, and I, I will actually say in defense of our institution of the War College, that our curriculum has actually gotten harder rather than easier over the years, which I'm glad for. Um, but, you know, for example, it used to be that you had to, to get a PhD, you had to pass a language exam in two foreign languages. I don't know any place that, I, or I shouldn't say any place, but I personally don't know many places that require that anymore. Um, foreign language training went out the window at undergraduate levels. Basic cultural literacy courses went out the windows. Your students just don't like them. You know, it's like, I, I mean, I was, I was one of those undergraduate advisors where kids thought I was tough because I wouldn't sign their course card if I thought it was, they were taking a lot of junk. I'm like, well, I'm your advisor. If you want, you know, if you want a different advisor to tell you something different, but I'm supposed to sign this and say that this is good. Um, we just don't do that. And in part, and this is something that does not affect the War College because we're a government institution, but at the undergraduate level, especially, colleges have become client experiences. They've become client servicing. Come here, you'll love the dorms, the rock climbing, the pizza in the quad, you know, the, the, the extracurriculars. And that, I think, has become a real problem, especially where you have untenured faculty who are afraid to tell students that they're wrong or make them angry because their contracts won't be removed. The most important function, one of the most important educational functions of tenure in those schools is to be able to say to a student, I know you tried hard. You're not good at this. That's why you got a D um, without worrying that they're going to get fired. Um, but in, in a university where increasingly you have young adjuncts who are on one and two year contracts, um, they just their thing is keep the clients happy, keep the customers happy. Don't generate bad reviews. Don't generate bad teaching evaluations. And I think that is, that's a, that's just bad. I think that's just bad for the higher education enterprise in general. I, I, I'm going to, John, I'm going to tell one quick story about education just to, before you go to the next question, I got a fellowship to go to Georgetown and I thought I was the cat's ass. I thought I was, you know, I, I was like, finally, I got a fellowship to go to Georgetown and I had this Jesuit philosophy professor and I, of course, I was going to argue with him all term about Plato because, you know, he'd read it in ancient Greek, but I read it too, you know, in English. And at the end of the term, um, and we became, I should just skip to the punch. I said, we became fast friends for like 30 years, but he did the thing I needed. At the end of the term, I got an A and I thought I was all that. I walk up to him at the Christmas party at Georgetown. And I said, hey, Merry Christmas, father. What do you say? Peace on earth, goodwill towards men. And he looked over his glasses at me and he said, what I say to you, Mr. Nichols, is repent. And I, you know, I suddenly like 
I was like, oh my God. And what he meant was, you're a bright young man. I really like you, but don't make this mistake. You're not there yet. And, and it, it just, it was one of the most important and valuable things that ever happened. This guy used to hand out a, an essay that he'd written at the beginning of every term called what a student owes to a teacher. Now imagine trying to do that today. In graduate school, by the way, I was a third year grad student. I was like 24, 25 years old and with a master's degree from Columbia starting at Georgetown. And he hands me this essay, what a student owes to a teacher. And I, to this day, it's in that, it's sitting in that bookcase right behind me. But imagine trying to hand that out to undergraduates today or, or to graduate students. You'd have a rebellion on your hands. Sorry, that was a little long. No, it was great. Um, Eisenhower is remembered for his industrial military complex speech, but he also warned about domination of technological scholars. Can you comment on that aspect? Sure. We're, we're headed for that. We're headed for technocracy because most Americans don't care to educate themselves enough about basic issues. And their answer is keep the lights on, keep the Wi-Fi strong, make sure that I've got 150 channels. And there are technocrats at every level of government saying, well, okay, that's what you want. I, I, in this forthcoming book, my argument is that this is happening not by design, but by default. People are ceding their independence be, out of, because they are angry and narcissistic. And, and most government elites cannot make sense of the demand signals they're getting. Again, like, you know, get rid of Obamacare, but keep the ACA. Get us out of Afghanistan, but don't surrender. Um, you know, get us, uh, you know, stand up to Pakistan, wherever that is. You know, that, I mean, at some point, people who actually have to function every day say, you know what, we'll, we'll do the best we can, and maybe we're not going to ask you these detailed questions anymore. And instead of just reading a newspaper and gaining basic cultural and political literacy, you have a bunch of kind of screaming, hysterical American citizens who are flooding the zone with noise. You know, when, when Roosevelt, at the outbreak of World War II, started giving radio talks, he asked uh, Americans, he said, please go get a map so you can um, follow, so that you can, um, you know, follow along with me. And stores all over the country ran out of maps. American citizens said, okay, Mr. President, you know, I don't know where Romania is. I don't know where, you know, the Volga River is, so I bought a map. People now are like, don't talk down to me. That's the, that is a huge part of it. Everybody, everybody in America thinks you're talking down to them if you say things like, well, you're wrong. I've said to people, you know, that, that thing you just said is not correct. It's just wrong. And they say, I can't believe how arrogant you are. I'm like, well, I, I can be less arrogant and say, I'm sorry you're wrong, but it, you're not less wrong. And that's, that, is, that makes governing literally impossible except for the technocrats who are going to say, you know what? We'll, we'll make sure Zoom works. We'll make sure the lights are on, the air conditioning is going to function. If you think about how quickly, you know, pay, the, the people in this country who say, I would, you know, I'm going to stand up for democracy. All you have to do is shut off their cell service for three hours and they'll lose their minds. Um, and, and, I, and I'm just, I, I don't know what to do about that. We are not a resilient, civic-minded society anymore, in part because we all think we know everything about what we're doing. And I, and I, I just don't know how to get around that anymore. I, I, I really thought that a national disaster would be the thing that kind of snapped us out of it, but I, I don't have that same confidence anymore. Some people have said the greatest advantage of Zoom is we get to see the backgrounds of where people live and what they do. Uh, somebody picked out the fact that there's a copy of your book, I believe, in Chinese. Has it in fact been translated into Mandarin and do you have any comments about the Chinese society's approach to these issues? Uh, it has been translated into both. Um, I guess there are the two forms of Chinese, the mainland and Hong Kong, Taiwan, new and old. I can't, I, I don't speak Chinese, so I don't understand the difference. Um, I was a little surprised actually that uh, the Chinese translated it at all. Um, I think China is, um, I am not a China panic person. I, I think China is a um, authoritarian and unsustainable regime that is eventually um, going to 
be able to un not be able to sustain the kind of uh, growth and gorging of its citizens on middle class luxuries uh, forever. Um, I think that um, you know that that's my my big concern is that the way they try and get out of that is through conquest and war. Um, but um, they are a more technocratic society than we are. Mo most places are a more technocratic society than we are at this point. Um, we have become a society that is kind of, um, you know, we have outsourced a lot of our technological knowledge because a lot of our own kids, and I know somebody's going to raise their hand and say, well, wait, my kid's a physics major. Okay, but I'm simply saying we have tons of people going to college, and yet we're not producing a lot of the kind of technical know-how that, that we used to produce, say, you know, after Sputnik or after the computer revolution in the 60s, um, that, that's just been petering out. So we have tons of people with college degrees who really have kind of high school plus degrees. And so I, I don't think we ought to do it the way the Chinese do it. I don't even think we ought to do it the way the Europeans do it, which is they, you know, the Europeans make this very hard cut and say, okay, 16, you're going to trade school, you're going to college. Um, but, you know, we can't, I think they have an unsustainable society, and I think so do we. And how that ends, I'm, I'm not sure. I used to be more confident about that, but not, not anymore. I think we've got time for about one more question. I see one here from one of my shipmates. It says, are you optimistic or pessimistic about the future writ large? I am pessimistic. Um, I think... Uh, I have never seen a situation, and part of the reason I wrote the next book, and I and I waited, by the way, just because I, you know, just to be upfront with everyone, I didn't like this book didn't come out, and then I said, great, you know, now I'll follow it on with this. I waited almost three years before writing another book because I was, I'm, I'm a scholar. I was curious about, you know, how are things going to pan out, and um, I don't see this getting any better, uh, and I think. Without trust, without cooperativeness, without some sense that, you know, we have to rely on the division of labor among us, um, we are going to fall into that technocratic end of democracy. Not the mob. I don't worry about, you know, mobs taking over. They're not, they're not capable enough to do it. They can cause a lot of damage. They can't. Populist governments suck at running things. The people that are really good at running things are technocratic governments. And I think, you know, in the end, that's probably what's going to happen is that we will have things, things that work and a middle class that lives a pretty good life and, you know, an impoverished class that where you know, poverty is kind of miserable, but not super miserable and a very wealthy class that, you know, provides support to this, you know, technocratic kind of regime that we're going to mutate into. And I think it's our own, the, next, the title of my next book is Our Own Worst Enemy. And I think all this is going to happen because it is on us. Uh, and we're, we're the ones that are causing this to happen because we are, we are just too narcissistic and lack civic virtue and awareness. And, and so we're, you know, I, I, want, I didn't want to believe that four years ago. I, I actually, and I'll just finish by saying, I started to write a piece about three years ago. I, yeah, I was working with the editors at uh, Foreign Affairs. And they said, what do you think this pandemic's? And I said, you know, this is it. This is the thing. We're going to start. Science is coming back. Respect for expertise. About three months into the pandemic, I called him and the editor and I just said, you know, this isn't. I just tore up the article. I said, and he went, yeah, I don't see it either. And so my optimism at the beginning of the pandemic that maybe this would rally us together about three or four months in, I just pulled the piece, and, and that's why I don't have a piece in Foreign Affairs about this. I, I pulled it and said, it, it just isn't happening, and I think it's it's not going to happen, and I'm really worried about the future. Sorry to be a bummer at the end of the afternoon, but. Okay, I'll give you one last opportunity to uh, end on an up note if you have one. Uh, anything you'd like to cover, Tom, that you haven't had the chance to do? I guess the, the, the optimistic thing I'll say is all of this is within our power to solve. And it just requires individual decisions that, you know, no, I'm not going to watch four hours of television every night that leaves me in an incoherent rage. Um, yes, I'm going to read one newspaper a day. You know, yes, I'm going to take a walk and, you know, go to a farmer's market and look at other human beings and think of myself as a member of a community. Um, you know, I'm going to read a book about something I don't know about, and I'm going to start from the assumption that I don't know about it. 
These are all individual decisions that are easy to make. And yet we don't do it because we've become so addicted to constantly feeding our own sense of being right about things. And um, so, you know, it doesn't, it's, it's, this is not an impossible problem to solve. It, we have it within us to do it. And I, I hope that, um, you know, we, we choose to do it over time. I, I have a lot of faith. I John, I'll end optimistically this way. Actually, as for all, I am known on the internet for being a terror to millennials and Gen Zers. But part of the reason I give them such, um, you know, slag them and give them such crap so often is I actually believe in them and I think they're going to be okay. And I think they're the ones that are going to save us from ourselves down the line. Well, thank you very much, Tom. Uh, terrific uh, presentation generated a lot of comments. Uh, and uh, we are sure that some people may want to reach out to you directly to continue these discussions. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, that'll yeah, conclude thanks for today's me. session. And uh, we invite all of you to come back in two weeks. And we're going to hear about the uh, future of warfare uh, with Dr. O'Hara. So thank you very much. Uh, continue to have a good summer.